Good afternoon, and welcome back to virtual programming from Metropolitan Community College in Omaha, Nebraska. Today, we are opening our programming in honor of Hispanic Latino Heritage Month. If you are a first time attendee, welcome. If you are returning after the late summer break, thank you so much for joining us again. My name is Barbara Velasquez. I'm excited to spend time with you as moderator or an assistant of International Intercultural Education Virtual Programming over the next nine to 10 months of the 2022-23 academic year. The United States will officially honor Hispanic Latino Heritage Month beginning on this Thursday, September 15th through October 15th recognizing and celebrating contributions of Hispanic and Latino champions who trace their roots to Spain, Mexico, Central America, South America, and the Spanish speaking nations of the Caribbean. The timing is key, always starting on September 15th, a day that marks the anniversary of independence of five Latin American countries, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua. Mexico and Chile follow, celebrating their independence September 16th and 18th, respectively. The 2022 national theme for Hispanic Heritage Month is Unidos, Inclusivity for a Stronger Nation. Your microphones and chat with other audience members are turned off, but you may always contact the hosts. Send your questions at any time to moderator Barbara Velasquez. Please watch the chat for a link to an online evaluation of today's program. We are beginning a year of over 50 opportunities to participate. Those who attend at least 20 programs and complete evaluations with your contact information will be recognized. Julio Ricardo Varela is proudly Puerto Rican through and through. And that identity has become not only who he is as a person, but also guided his career as a firebrand journalist, activist, and pioneer in Latino media. Previously acting as interim co-executive director at Futuro Media, Varela is now president. During his eight-year career at Futuro and more than 30 years of experience in the editorial space, he has demonstrated journalistic and business excellence, founding and leading Latino Rebels, and building the Futuro Studios business pipeline for the organization. Varela will continue to focus on the business side of the organization and play a key leadership role in overseeing the addition, the editorial vision of Futuro Media. In 2011, Varela founded Latino Rebels, one of the top U.S. Latino digital media sites in the world. In 2018, Latino Rebels officially joined the Futuro Media family. He also co-hosts In the Thick with Maria Hinojosa and is an MSNBC columnist. He is a frequent contributor to Latino USA and as digital director for Futuro from 2015 to 2020, expanded the show's digital footprint, overseeing historic gains in online and social audiences. Previously, Julio was digital producer for, for Al Jazeera America's The Stream, and his work has been featured in many global outlets, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, The Atlantic, The Guardian, ESPN, NBC News, Quartz, Le Monde, WGBH, WNYC, Face the Nation, MSNBC, Fusion, Univision, and Telemundo. He has made numerous national TV appearances for Latino USA and Futuro Media. In 2015, the National Association of Hispanic Journalists honored Varela with its inaugural Dale Award, given to an individual or company that steps up and goes above and beyond to ensure Latinos are fairly and accurately represented. He was also a contributing reporter at the Boston Globe and a top publishing executive. Varela graduated cum laude from Harvard College. Please welcome Julio Ricardo Varela, who will present The New America. Thank you, uh, 
Barbara for that kind introduction. Um, it's just so weird when people read my bio, but hi, I'm Julio. Nice to meet everybody. Um, I am uh, lecturing from Massachusetts, from Boston, Massachusetts, where I'm based, and it's really nice to be with you all. I am going to share my screen, but I also told Barbara that if there are questions, and please like send them my way. I'm, I don't want to talk too much, but um, I really want to turn this into a a conversation for you, probably in the next hour, a dialogue. Um, no question is um, a bad question, and I'm I'm just really really excited to be here. So with that said. I'm going to get into the technical aspect of the lecture by sharing my screen. Let me start there. <laughs> okay. Let me then press play. And here we go. So, yes, uh, this is going to talk about the new America, um, which I like to say is already here. And, and it is Latino. And there's too much data and information to out there that would that it's hard to refute that claim. So before I get into it, because what I'm going to do is dive into, you know, I'm going to give you census information. I'm going to give you information about con consumption of media to frame what I mean. And especially what I want to do by doing that is also get into a little bit of where Latinos are politically. Um, but let me just dive into it. I only have about six or seven slides and, I, and then I'm gonna probably stop sharing the screen. But before that, this is what, what I do. It's Futuro Media. It's a company founded in 2010 by Mariano Hosa. We just won a Pulitzer Prize about three months ago, which is, um, that is the, the holy grail of journalism. Um, it's a podcast called Suave. And uh, we're really, really happy and proud of that. I'm the co-host of In the Thick, a political podcast that Maria and I have been doing together since 2015, where we focus on issues of communities of color and, and Latinos. Latino Rebels the Company is a digital site that I started in 2011 that I no longer run. Um, other people run it, but I am the founder and have a really good team and we're doing a really, really great job in, in, in DC. So if you're interested in sort of Latino leaning news in English out of DC, particularly, um, please follow Latino Rebels. We're always, you just find us on social media or latinorebels.com. Latino USA, 30 year radio show that focuses on US Latino experiences. Um, it's on public radio, we're a podcast. We've won countless of awards. I tell anyone, if you want to understand the complexity about our community, and if you're not following Latino USA or consuming our stories, then you're missing out on part of that complexity. And then finally, I get to share my really cool cartoon face because I also get to write for MSNBC. So um, I'm an MSNBC columnist and super excited about that. And I write weekly um, opinion pieces. So that's my world. And like Barbara says, I spend a lot of time talking about representation, uh, trying to flip the narratives that we hear, trying to challenge stereotypes. Um, I, when I talk about the new America, I talk a lot about myself. I'm a bilingual, bicultural kid who is Generation X, who was born and raised in, in Atorrey, Puerto Rico. I'm proudly Boricua, as my bio says, and have always felt that media never saw me. So instead of me complaining about media, I decided to be like, I'm going to create my own lane because that's really important. And technology and the digital space has given us more tools as a community to say, you know what? We don't have to rely on others to tell our stories. Um, it's, it was kind of a bold like risk, but it felt right. Um, I am a Gen Xer. I am, I've been married for 25 years. I have two kids in college. Um, I live in the Boston area. I root for the Puerto Rican national basketball team and I root for the US national soccer team. That's my world, right? And that world of being bilingual and bicultural is such a common world that you don't see it as much on television, right? You don't see it as much on the movies or in news or in journalism. So I'm really proud of the fact that that's who I represent. 
because I do believe that our generation or even the generation behind me is actually going to represent a lot of how this country is changing and changing in a good way. So I want to share a little bit of, you know, whenever I try to frame this, I really want to frame what the new America is. And I always use the census. And I pull these quotes from the reports because I'm not making this up. I'm not giving you an opinion. This is what the federal government is what the census says. And I like to read this to give you a framing. And then I'll have some fun charts and I'll show some consumption and talk about politics and then get into sort of some back and forth and kind of some takeaways. But it's important to note that the Hispanic or Latino population right now, according to the US, um, the US census is at 62.1 million people growing 23% um, while the population that was not Hispanic or Latino origin grew 4.3%. So if you think about that, the Latino community in the United States is growing five times as much as any other community in the United States. And that was in a period of 10 years. And you can see that because of that, it is now close to 20% of the US population. Um, this is the big crazy quote that I always, this is the one that blows me away whenever I share it. And it's in bullet two, slightly more than half, 51.1% of the total Latino population growth. And this is US, I'm sorry, total US population growth between 2010 and 2020 came from growth in the Hispanic or Latino population. Think about that. More than half of the total U.S. population in the United States came from the Hispanic or Latino community. Then, and this is what I mean about the new America, because of this, you can see that in 2020, with Hispanics and Latinos, 26.2 million people identified their race as some other race alone, which is a 41% change from 2010. So when you really start looking at these top line reports, people who were might have identified as white in 2020 were Latino, that decreased by 52.9% in 20, I'm sorry, in 2010 and 2020. So it means that Latinos are more are representing a more multi, they're more multiracial, they're more multi-ethnic. They're more multilingual. And that means that this country is changing. And it's changing for the good, is what I always say. So here are the fancy charts from the, the census to show you if you don't like reading bullets. This shows the population growth between 2010 and 2020 in terms of being close to 20% of the US population identifies as Hispanic or Latino. That is a significant population. Um, you can see. When you break this down, when I was talking about race, because race is very complex when it comes to Latin America and 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 Latinos, and you know, I I have I've written a lot about this, and we can definitely get into this part of this aspect about what the new American means. But right now, what it means is that this growing population does not identify as being white. So this notion of America of whiteness in America is being challenged already. Um, and you can see that this change in race reporting, this is an, a, a, an amazing statistic. When you look at 52.9% decrease of Hispanic or Latinos that identified as white, you start seeing more of a, a close to 100, 115% increase in identifying as American Indian, Indian as indigenous, right? You can see um, this two or more races as well. Look at that number. That's that is amazing. That number alone to me is just amazing. I do think this is a number as well. This negative six point four percent that gets into a little bit of what I feel is happening in this country of what we've seen as a sort of historic black white paradigm that it, this is also being challenged. And actually, I would argue sometimes for the bad as opposed to for the good. But this alone is not the America that of the last 20, 30 years. And that's where I think you'll start seeing like these challenges 
to what we feel is the American status quo. And, and that, that future is Latino. The next slide, if I can get to it, there it is. Um, it's also young. <laughs> Think about this, okay? Percentage of distribution and race of Hispanic origin by age group, okay? When you look at how young our community is, where you see it, it's just, it's just my, like right now, there is a stat that's going to probably blow your mind when I say it. Um, the median age of Latinos in this country, the median age is 11 to 12 years old. Think about that. This is only the beginning. So when you see that growth, you start seeing 11 to 12 years old. What does it mean? What does it mean for the country? So one of the set, one of the things that that the data is challenging, and 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 I think one of the things that I to give you guys because I, I I really want you to come away with bigger takeaways here, and a lot of things have to do with with language, right? If you really think about the history of America and assimilation and acculturation, um, and migration and immigration, this notion that English is not something that our community values is actually factually wrong, right? All the data has suggested in the last 10 years that Latinos and Hispanics are actually becoming more proficient in English. Um, and you can see, and I pulled this report, this is a really interesting report that I, and this is all linked and I shared this with Barbara, if the people want, you can just, and it's just a couple of links, but it kind of gives you the grounding, right? But look at this, 2020, 2020 survey of Hispanics ages 13 to 85, found that three quarters say they speak English very well or well. Um, and when you look at the consumption of this, this, this is another thing that just really kind of challenges what I mean by the new America. So this notion of acculturation, which is very controversial, um, not necessarily assimilation, but acculturation, is that you start seeing that English proficiency with, with US Latinos is at an incredibly high rate and also in a bicultural space. When you think about Spanish, Spanish, even though you have 30 million, 40 million people who speak Spanish in the United States, um, you can't compare the Spanish language. You know, you can, you can say like there's more Spanish speakers in the United States than there are in Mexico, but it's a different culture. You know what I mean? Like what we're seeing is a more bilingual, bicultural um, wave. And, you know, I, I know if you watch television or maybe you watch your commercials and you don't, when you DVR things, you start seeing it. Like you look at Target ads, like a perfect example is a company like Target, where their advertisements are just showing all these Latino families speaking English, consuming, going to Target, like as American as any Target ad you would see in the last 30 years. And that's just one example. So when you start seeing advertisers showing representation, you start realizing that people see power and dollars in this, because in the end, this is the United States. It's about, you know, it's about money in a lot of ways, but it's about purchasing power. But this is fascinating for me as a journalist. This is like, when you look at how people consume content, you could see that this is just mind boggling for me. Like, I bet you most people think that the vast majority of Latinos in this country, and I'm talking, I'm not, I'm not talking about you all, but I'm talking about the mainstream culture, right? If you ask average Americans, what, you know, they think that only Latinos only speak Spanish. But the data is proving that completely differently. So when you look at the fact that in the United States, 5%, of respondents, 
on the internet, on television, on radio, and in print, 6%, right, are Spanish only. This part here, the Spanish and English equally, the English only or the English mostly, that's the new America. Okay? That's where the interesting things are happening. Um, that's where like a show like This Fool, which I'm obsessed with on Hulu, is hitting home as a hit. We're starting to see media, both as journalists, reflect that. It's becoming more common. Granted, I work at a company, a nonprofit media company that has been playing in this space for longer and winning a Pulitzer, um, which is awesome. Uh, but this is where we see the change, right? So when we all know that media has an incredible influence on perceptions, consumption of media, on who we are as a people, who people think of us, what people think of us. But this, I would argue, when you look at it, whether you're an advertiser or a politician or a media company, I would argue that there's, oh, sorry, let me just go back. More, because of the assumptions that people think that we're more Spanish dominant, more of the, the money goes here, right? When in fact, the money and <laughs> the interest and the attention needs to go here. Spanish and English equally, English only, English mostly. And the perfect example, and Barbara just asked me to, just touched upon politics for a little bit, and we're definitely going to get into a discussion after this. But I just want to kind of, this is my last slide, last two, like, this is my last slide, and then we're, I'm just going to go back and stop sharing my screen, is when you look at recent polling, and this is actually a recent poll that just came out. Um, it just came out, like, a couple of months. It's uh, Unidos US and Mi Familia Vota. When you look at the midterms, when you think about language, when you think about understanding our community, when you think about parties that understand that they have to be culturally connected to us, what's, what's, what's actually happening is, is the opposite. So when you start saying that 47% of Latinos surveyed across the nation said no one has contacted them to encourage the vote, when I, when I just showed you the numbers, right, when you have 50 you know, close to 60 million people. And then out of those 60 million, you have probably like half who are eligible to vote. We're talking about a voting cohort, 30 million people. When only half of them feel like they haven't been contacted by, by major political parties during the midterms, it talks about what, you know, chronic under-engagement and under-investment in these voters. What's interesting is because of the demographics, because demographics in the end is destiny, Considering that there's higher participation, what Martina said, what the, and this is linked as well to NBC News, the data has showed that our voting participation has been growing finally, right? If you think about it, it makes sense. When I showed you the acculturated like slide from a couple of couple, you know, a couple of slides back, you're starting to get more engaged into democratic society. So it goes, it goes to show that as you grow, you're going to get more invested civically. Um, this is the part where political parties are missing this opportunity, right? Um, I'm just going to stop my share. Let me see if I can just get out of there. Okay, I stopped my share. But if you think about it, I, I really wanted to break this down in a sense of how you might have the numbers, but the attitudes to take advantage of those numbers, whether it's politics, whether it's higher education, whether it's media, whether it's journalism, whether it's business, whether it's you know being on the boards of businesses, whether it's being a judge, whether, you know, whether it's being on the school board, it's just not matching, right? Because there's this lack of understanding of who we are. Now, I could have easily shown you 
other slides, and maybe I'll ask this question and maybe someone can answer this. If you, I, well, let me ask you, let me ask this question. Maybe we can get it at a chat bar or whatever. Um, who, and you can put it in the chat or whatever you guys want to do. Um, name me a state in this country with the highest growth of Latinos percentages, like in the last 10, in the last 10 years. Like, I'm sure you're going to say California, Texas, Florida. No. And I don't know if anyone wants to jump in and, and say it before I say it. Um, Nebraska is a good one. Iowa is a good one. Close. I like the fact Nebraska. That's a great point by Soledad. Claudia says Iowa. You guys are getting close. It's really, it's not Arizona. The Midwest in general, our chambers. This is exactly my point that I'm trying to make. Illinois, not Illinois, North Dakota, right? But Nebraska, Iowa, um, South Dakota, Idaho, Montana. Um, we're starting to see places, you know, you take a place like North Dakota, there are parts of North Dakota that have a thousand percent growth of Latinos. And it makes sense if you think about it, right? North Dakota with their jobs, oil, you know, people need to work, right? But think about that. Just think about North Dakota for a second. Think about the fact, you know, when you see the census information where you say like half the US population grew because of, of Latin, you know, Latinidad. But if you take a place like North Dakota, it's like what I always say. It's like, imagine if a thousand Latinos showed up at some at some town in North Dakota, just like showed up one day, like there's your thousand percent growth. What does that mean? You know what I'm saying? What does that mean to the town? What does that mean to the economy? What does that mean that you can get a hell of a Mexican food now in North Dakota? Believe me, Mariana Jose went, got some of the best tacos she ever had, like pupusas in North Dakota. This is what I mean. Right. Because we all think in grain, you know, Hispanic Heritage Month, as problematic as it is, but it's, you know, I always say every day is Hispanic Heritage Month at Futuro Media because that's what I do. But we'll, we'll go with the month. But we've been traditionally ingrained to think that, you know, Latinos are concentrated in California, in Arizona, in New Mexico, in Texas, in Florida, in New York, in Chicago, uh, even up here. So, like, it's been in pockets. But that is no longer the case. We have a presence in each and every state in this country. Um, you know, you start looking at, you know, politically, for example, like a lot of focus goes to Miami, right? Or goes to, I don't know, uh, you know, Texas, right? Everyone's like, now everyone's very interested in South Texas. But you take a state like Georgia, where you look at those numbers I gave you, you look at the fact that because people still don't understand our complexity, you have parties that there's so many voters out there. There's so many voters because there hasn't been that connection culturally and authentically, right? So to me, understanding who we are as a community, understanding that we come from whatever 21 countries or, you know, some of us have been in this country for generations. You know, if you look at the history of the Hispanos in New Mexico, or you look at the history of South Texas, which was part of Mexico, you know, before it wasn't part of Mexico, you know what I mean? It's like, it's not like people just showed up. They were living there. Right. So when you look at the, 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 you know, we don't do a good enough job explaining the US Mexico war um, as, as an American, you know, in American history. We do, a you know, the Civil War gets a lot of attention, but, but a lot of the US Mexico war, if you really think about it, that literally transformed this country. Right. It literally created a new country. And, and it wasn't like migration. It wasn't like people migrated. It's like people were living in Mexico. And then next thing you know, the U.S. defeat the Mexicans. And next thing you know, you're part of the United States. 
And we're still trying to come to terms with generations of that, right? So you have sort of the traditional historical roots, but then when you get to the fact that as anything, because we are in America and like, you know, there are other opportunities in other places outside of the traditional pockets that we're beginning to see sort of these places in this country, in states where Latinos can play a role politically. So one of the things I say all the time um, when I talk about political media and I talk about understanding this demographic change is imagine if we as a country or whether it's media or whether political parties treated every place that has Latinos as actual swing states, right? Like I live in New England, right? And all of a sudden every four years, New Hampshire becomes this really important state in the national conversation, right? Because that's where the investment is. Iowa, that's where the investment is, you know? But what's interesting is like, what you're finding is instead of just assuming that a place like California will always be what it is or, or even Arizona, right? Like you're seeing this change. You are seeing this change. If political parties, if, and, and particularly both of them, I mean, this has nothing to do with whether you're Democrat or Republican, but if you start treating certain pockets of this country where there is a heavy Latino population with actual investment, with actual swing states, I would argue that you would see what power really is because we're still on, it's still untapped because the numbers are showing it, right? Like I said, it goes back to my point. The numbers are there. What is it that you want to do with it? And, and it's because I really, really strongly believe that there's such a deep misunderstanding of who we are as a community. And, you know, our community spans, you know, a new arrival to five generations, you know, and, and everything in between. You know, I come from a place that is a colony. I don't know what else to say. It's part of the United States. But, you know, we're going into our 125th year of, of, of being invaded by the United States, right? And we are the second largest population of Latinos behind Mexican, Mexican Americans in the United States. And people still don't understand what Puerto Ricans do. I don't know if you, you know, I, I, I don't know if you read this, but, you know, I'm very vocal. I was very vocal because I'm not vocal at all. You know, I have no opinions. Um, I'm very vocal about, you know, the specific example I always bring about investing in the wrong thing. How many people saw West Side Story? The Spielberg version. You can, you can hit your, you can hit your Zoom, right? You saw it, right? You saw West Side Story um, last year. It got, you know, tons of attention. Um, and this is what I mean about this specific thing. In the eyes of Hollywood, in the eyes of the American mainstream, this is how Puerto Ricans are viewed. This is the one Puerto Rican story that has been told since like 1959, right? So in essence, you could say what you want. Oh, Spielberg, he brought, he brought Puerto Rico. Like they, I'm not knocking Ariana DeBose winning the Oscar. Believe me, she kicked ass. And I also love the music. I have this love-hate relationship with, with West Side Story. But the point being is that singular story has defined what Americans have viewed Puerto Ricans as for close to 60 years, right? We're just gang members living in New York, can't speak English, but you know, when in fact, we're so much richer and so much deeper. And that if we have the, if, if we talk about investment and realizing that the companies that see the future of this company, of this country are going to be the companies that thrive in this country. That's where we're at right now as a community. 
Um, we've already passed the sleeping giant and, you know, we can go back to the last couple of years, like the last decades. It's like every prediction about Latinos being the next sort of transformation of this country has been, is correct. It's when now the question for us is who, what do we do as a country to acknowledge that reality? And what does our community, our Latino community do to acknowledge our new place in a new America? Because this is where I argue the other side, the bad side of this. If we look at the history of Latin America and by the way, I was like listing all these like, you know, countries that are celebrating independence. Um, we bring our baggage to the United States. You know, people tend to forget that, um, you know, enslaved peoples, there are more enslaved peoples from Africa in Latin America than they were in the United States. We tend to forget the history of colorism and the establishment of colonial racism through the Spanish system. There was literally a caste system. Right. I, I don't know if you've studied this or not, but there's this amazing and you can find it. There's this amazing. Like colonial piece of art from from the Spanish colonial times. Where you see every label of who you were in society, if you're if you had two white Spaniard parents or if a white Spaniard married a black African or if an indigenous person indigenous person married an indigenous person like or if you know the lowest of the low was like two enslaved people from africa had a had a child and you can see the progression of society the caste system that celebrates whiteness in latin america and 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 you know and and propagated anti-blackness so this is why I, I try to bring it together in the census when you start seeing the census saying, well, Latinos in this country don't see themselves as white. Then what do they see themselves? Are they going to challenge whiteness in America? Are they going to stand behind anti-blackness, especially what we've seen in the last couple of years? Are, are they going to embrace this new America and, and understand that we play a role of allyship where, where, where we are, you know, especially since, since the quote unquote racial transformation, which according, you know, maybe lasted, you know, we're kind of past that, right. As a community, you know, I, I, I look at Spanish language news coverage sometimes on the black lives matter movement. And it's, it's not good. It's not good. It's anti-blackness in our face in Spanish language. And when you start seeing sort of that type of that type of ideology penetrate itself politically, then you wonder why. You wonder why, well, you know, you know, Latino, like why are Republicans doing better in South Texas? Right? Why? Because we also have our own problems. <laughs> you know, I know plenty of Latinos out there who said, well, you know, I came here the right way. Or that's not my situation. My migration story is different. It, it reeks of privilege and, and, and lack of historical knowledge that this notion of us being this united, you know, 60 million community is just wrong it's just not right we're incredibly like diverse we're we're diverse ideologically we're diverse racially um there's still a lot of things that we have to do internally as a community but we also have to find our place in america at the same time so it's too easy to say like oh the new america right here are the latinos we're here it comes like it's all good when in fact we have to do our own internal like checking in and checking ourselves within the context of an American society. And that's why I always say that these issues of identity and race and ethnicity and our place in America is quite messy, right? And we have to have real conversations with us as a community to kind of address that messiness.
So I shared a lot. I don't know if you want me to keep talking or if you guys want to jump in with questions or dialogue. Um, but I do think this notion of finding our place in American society, our community, the jury's still out. The jury is still out, but you can see these issues of underinvestment, underrepresentation, misunderstanding of who we are from the external side, not looking honestly at ourselves. It's something else that we just can't kind of figure. We have to figure it out ourselves as a community sometimes, as opposed to waiting for people to understand us. So, so the new America is is messy, but it's you know you're going to get better pupusas, um, you know, all over the country which I always think is a good thing, you know, <laughs> getting good pupusas anywhere is if I can get them in, you know, in Nebraska, then I'm winning. Um, so, yeah, I hope anyway. everybody had their lunch or they're really going to start getting hungry here. <laughs> I know. Sorry. Like I'm, I'm, I know I'm on Eastern time and I haven't eaten my lunch. <laughs> I'm not, you know what I'm thinking about. I might order some pupusas. <laughs> so anyway, by run. Um, so, so that's pretty much it. I know we have some more time by run. I, I don't want to, take all yeah. the all the time and I want to make sure that we give people the opportunity to to really um right. engage me or, or so I'm I'm all ears. So um I know some people might send questions directly to you Julio and we can you know give a priority but I do have some that have come in. Um great. Appreciate your um showing us this change in population. How has that reflected on the workforce? That's a good question. I mean, I think, yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, it, it depends on what part of the workforce, right? I think, I think when you look at the pandemic and you look at the concepts of who was quote unquote an essential worker, right? That's so we're coming out of this. Um, it was pretty clear to me, and the data shows it. And if you look at how COVID-19 impacted our community in different parts, it made a lot of sense to me, right? One of the most scary statistics that if you really start looking, and I'm quoting the CDC, and I don't have this in front of me, but it's something that's ingrained in my head and I've tweeted it out, is that Latino men from like 30 to 46 were, we're one of the largest groups. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. It's it's there it, now. It kind of went out for a little bit. Are we good? Uh, hold on. I think it went to my iPods and this is exactly okay. You guys can hear me? Yes. Again? Yes. Okay, sorry. This is this is where I have to like keep my hands here because I hit the cord. But I was gonna say, when you look at the data, one of the biggest groups of people who died due to COVID were Latino men from like, I believe like 35 to 50. And if you really start thinking about it, think about it, who had to work, who had to deliver food, who had to like not have, cause we are still, there's uh, the workforce is still very service driven, right? We're not in the upper echelon. Like we're still trying to like, it's, it's just the classic immigrant, you know, story. Like we're still trying to, get to the next level so that to me indicates that we're still a workforce that might be a little bit more unskilled right now and educate and, and we're just starting to to see that begin to evolve and change as we as we become more you know as generations as it's a classic immigrant you know there's nothing different from other immigrant stories right especially when you focus on communities that come from latin american countries right from Central American countries, like I'm Puerto Rican, you know, I say our experience is very migrant, right? And it's not, you know, when, when people say like, we're part, we're Americans, but we live a migrant experience, right? So I, I can't, and I understand where like immigration plays, I've covered it all it's up for a long time. But I think that's the big question, right? In terms of it, that number hasn't led to representation in places that could influence narratives. There was a great um, study by uh, Representative Joaquin Castro of Texas, I believe a couple of years ago, and it's in the GAO, the General Accountability Office of the United States, um, and you can easily search for it. 
um, talking about the labor force of the Latino community. And it, it, it's still very um, disproportionate to really important jobs. I mean, I'm not knocking construction and service. I mean, especially service during the time of COVID. Um, many people fed us. Um, but that to me is the biggest, we're not there yet. The data is still showing that we're still in that place. And that doesn't necessarily translate to economic and political power because you're not in positions of influence. And it does get to the notion of class and, and wealth and wealth generation and the obstacles. Um, that's just beginning. So that's where I think sometimes we get, we overestimate too much about our purchasing power. Like, but we don't fight it. I mean, like, you know, the biggest moviegoers that buy tickets for films are Latinos because, you know, we like to take everyone on a Sunday. You know, everyone goes and buys tickets. But when you look at like, you know, if we're 25 to 30 percent of all moviegoers and ticket buyers, but we're only, you know, two to three percent of all roles in film, there's a major disconnect. There's a major disconnect. And that speaks to the fact that on the executive level, you know, I'm a unicorn. I'm a president of a media company and there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of me's doing what I do. So, so that to me is like, that's a challenge, right? And that's where I think we have to be more conscious of that because data and demographics and, and size do not necessarily lead to economic advancement or job advancement. Um, and I think it comes down to the lack of representation in, in a lot of ways. So I hope that answers your question, but I, I hope uh, um, that, that stat from the COVID-19 just still startles me every time I say it. So related to that question, um, one of the viewers has shared with us that a candidate we have for Congress, Tony Vargas, lost okay. his, his parent, he's from New York and his parents still lived in New York. Um, his father, passed away during uh, ha having caught COVID during the pandemic. And he was a um, meatpacking plant worker. I'm yeah. going to send this out to everybody because she comments that there's a really good article about it in the BBC. And it's good to know who your um, candidates are, right? Um, I wanted to throw in here, but one of the questions I'm getting makes me wonder if, you know, if you aren't Hispanic or Latino and you fill out the census or you fill out other forms, you may not know that you have to check one item that says, I, yeah. I call myself Hispanic Latino, but then mm -hmm. you're required to say, are you black, white, yeah. indigenous, all those things, right? So one of the, I mean, it, I know some people will say, I don't know what to check, right? I don't right. know who to call myself. One of our audience members says, go back to what you said about Hispanics considering themselves white. And I thought I'd yeah. that to kind of help, help yeah, yeah, yeah. required to choose something. Yeah, so, I mean, you can look at the history of the census, right? Um, and we did a great piece on Latino USA with the first, uh, the, the current US census director is Latino. He's the first one ever, he's from San Antonio. But there was a time in the census, and let's be honest, the census has, has had major problems with communities, with black communities, with indigenous communities. You know, they use census data for the internment of Japanese Americans, right? So let's, you gotta be honest with like the federal government and, you know, has had its issues and, and they've had to publicly apologize specifically for, for um, using census data to intern Japanese Americans during World War II. So it's really hard, you know, it's like, you only work with the data that you have, right? But I do think we need to remember the historical roots of census questions. So back in the day, in the 60s and the 70s, and before this invented label, because if you look at the, how we were categorized, uh, Hispanic, you know, in a sufficient government label, as problematic as that is, we can have that debate. Um, that really became sort of um, 
a way to try to group us for the first time. And in, in the 1980 census, um, for the veterans in the room, I don't know if you remember, but I do remember it as a kid watching Univision. There was all these ads in Spanish to be like, this is a time we're going to count and count ourselves. Mark Hispanic in, in the census. Like this was a new thing. And that's, you know, we're talking 40, 42 years, right? This is maybe one generation, two generations. So there, there's sort of this sense of resentment to the, to the, it's almost like a government imposed like categorization that they've had to struggle with for the last four years. So one of the things that came out of this, and I actually wrote about this in 2013, uh, that the New York Times was using new data, basically celebrating, saying like more Hispanics claim themselves as white in the 2010 census. Um, and it kind of raised serious questions about sort of exactly what you're saying, Barbara, and, and what the commenter is saying about how things get imposed on us as opposed to who we really are and who we really represent. So what I'm seeing now is sort of that pushback, that now we're starting to see the census as imperfect as it is. And I'm still pretty confident that the data that they have, that's why I wanted to show that two or more races stat, because that's a ridiculous stat, like that 540, like that's just the fact that more and more Latinos consider them biracial. Like that, I, that adds questions about who we are as a people, how we view ourselves, right? But you can't have a conversation about Latinidad without trying to address whiteness and white supremacy in the sense of, that's what I go back to my original point of like, being white in Latin America has, has made, is, you know, we all know, like we have families and I'm talking about my community, you know, I'm, I'm kind of in the middle of the road in my family in Puerto Rico. And, you know, my whiter cousins, are the more successful ones. My darker cousins aren't. I mean, that's in one family, right? So this notion, what I, what I actually think I can make out of the current census data is that we as a community are finally being asked, as imperfect as it is, to actually assess who we really identify with, right? So. I identify as a Puerto Rican man. I, I don't mark white. Because to me, like white to me is like, I don't know, you know, Anglo-Saxons in Vermont. And that's just not who I am. Like I grew up in Puerto Rico, right? But I understand that I am whiter in the eyes. Like people see me as white right here. And so... That type of, this is where it gets really tricky because the census leads to power, right? You remember the citizenship question that was going to get added in the 2020 census. So you can say what you want about the census, whether you're a fan or not, but it's directly tied to power and access to resources. So one way to say, like, we are changing this country, you know, when you start, when people use, people use census data for, redi for districting, for, you know, federal funds to communities, there's a direct consequence of, of trying to portray a census count that's accurate because it's going to lead to power, it, 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 or at least the path to power, right? It's not going to instantly make us powerful, but at least it gives us the opportunity. It, it tries to even the playing field. Right, whether it's the right tool, it's the tool that's in front of us. So I try to tell people it's like answer whatever you want to answer, but participate because if we're not accurately reflecting our communities, then we're gonna lose power. That's that to me is the big we're gonna lose the bigger fight in this. So I try to tell people when it comes to identity we have to just really let each one of us kind of roll with how we identify and, and, and understand our complexity 
and not impose, you know, I reacted to Hispanic as a kid because I thought it was a government in post term. So I, I was of the generation X world that Latino is what you want to say. Latino is problematic. I get it. And then it leads to another way, you know, Latinx, Latine, like, and then you're like, what do we call ourselves? And it's like, to me, it's like those complexities are tied to who we are as a people, to our roots. And if we're not having those honest conversations about how we identify and how we tend to, we can't settle our role in America and in, in society if we don't address our own issues with how we identify with race as Latinos. It's just what it is. And if we don't come to that, we're going to be having this conversation when we get to 100 million people who identify as Latino. Um, and we're going to still be asking ourselves this. And what's very interesting from a political ideology, and this is why I find this to be quite, um, quite interesting, is that as we grow and as we stay connected to our countries of origin, because that's the difference in, it, in the end, right? You know, my wife's family's from Ireland, right? They're Boston Irish, but they can't get in a car and drive to Ireland. You know what I mean? Like some kid in San Diego who has, you know, who has family in Mexico is in Tijuana or wherever in Baja California in an hour. Like it's just part of our world. Right. So we are going to import both the good and the bad of our Latin American countries of origin into our into our politics. And it's already happening. So that's why I feel that. Political parties, mainstream political parties need to understand that. Yeah, like I say, it's like we're not a monolith that, that we got past that. That's now become like that's just, I'm really happy that people say that now and and no one questions it but they still don't understand that we come from diverse communities. We come from different countries. We have different issues. And that's why I say, you got to treat us like swing States. So um, yeah, I can get into this. This is like my geek world. And so I don't know if there's another question or comment. Yeah. Well, there is one related to this and I'm going to take you back into history. Okay. In the 1954 Hernandez versus Texas case, the Supreme court affirmed that Mexicans were white. Given that, what percent of Hispanic Mexican population internalized that? That's a great question. And also remember, and I don't know the people who grew up in Texas, but all the stories of, you know, children of Mexican families in Texas who couldn't speak Spanish, like who were literally beaten in school districts for speaking Spanish, right? So that. That's a really great like point in the sense of is what I mean about things getting imposed on you. Because in the end, whiteness in the United States is seen as the, you know, the, ah, whiteness. We must achieve white. If you achieve whiteness, you're gonna win, right? I actually think that that's being challenged now by Latinos in who are younger than me, right? Who, 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 who have seen, you know, who know about Texas versus Hernandez and go, but that's not who I am. Because if I'm identified as white, then I have that in common with, you know, Jim, the Jim Crow South. And people don't even know the history of, of lynchings in the Southwest of Mexicans. There's a history of that. At the same time, you look at the history of the Texas Rangers. I mean, Texas is the South. Like, I know families in Texas who tell me about how the Texas Rangers like terrorize their families at the turn of the century. So it's fascinating to me because when you really look at like the Mexican experience in the United States, um, I go back to the Bracero program, right? When you look at like Mexicans as cheap labor right? After World War II, because, or during World War II, I'm like, you wonder why? It's like, ah, because all the, all the guys are fighting in the United States. All the men are fighting and we got to build stuff. So 
let's bring in the Mexicans, right? So then you see the pushback in the 50s with that. And I'm not going to say the term because I found it to be totally offensive, but there was literally a federal program under, under General Eisenhower, under President Eisenhower, that literally deported Mexicans back. And guess what? There were plenty of American citizens who were Mexican, who are Mexican descent, who got sent back to Mexico. And if we don't think that our immigration system is not racially targeting, um, or it's not rooted in xenophobia, then that's, you're missing out, you know, that is America. If there's anything about American history, it's that, right? Um, so I feel that with being Mexican American in the United States, it's like, some days were great, like it's awesome, right? Being, you know, the largest Latino group in the United States, Mexican American. But the history of oppression, the history of, of um, forced deportation, the history of, of racialization um, is there. So when, so when, you know, and I've spoken so much about candidate Trump's comment in 2015, that literally started his campaign. His campaign was started on anti-Mexicanism because it's an American tenant, right? So, you know, it goes out there and I know for a fact, I mean, I'm talking about Mexican American friends from all stripes. They saw it, I mean, Latinos saw it. And, but at the same time, you see my fellow non-Latino journalists and black journalists saw it too. I just wanna say, Shout out to all my black journalists, allies who were like, what he said, that's hate speech, right? So we saw it, like black and Latino journalists saw it, right? But what's interesting is that you see non-Latino journalists, mostly white political journalists, making these silly, believing, believing this, right? To be like, oh, wait, um, so are Mexicans rapists, right? And that's my whole point is what I said at the beginning. It's like, there's this misperception of Latinos being foreign born, Spanish speaking, not of here. And all the data shows, all the data shows that we are a part of this country. We're a fabric of this country. We've been here for generations. Um, we are not the quote unquote other, even though you paint that on us. And that's a powerful, powerful like, message that you're trying to dismantle but believe me it's like dismantling a battleship and like someone like me like i'm futuro media and i'm like just a little tugboat trying to punch at it and we have to be conscious of the fact that anti-mexican anti-mexicanism in particularly in particular has incredibly racialized origins in this country and and this is the part that drives me crazy about this and maria Hinojosa says it all the time it's like like Tex-Mex food is like the best thing ever. Like, you know, tortas and tacos and quesadillas. And like, it's just part of American cuisine. So it's like, you like our food, but you don't like us. I'm like, maybe that's the most American thing going. But you know what I'm saying? It's like, that part is just, and I do think to get to the question about internalizing that, you, you take a place like Texas, and I'll, and I'll show the example of Uvalde. It's a perfect example. You know, Uvalde is an incredibly, like, Mexican, Mexican-American town. But in the history of Uvalde in Texas, its leaders were mostly white Texans. So what you see in places like West Texas are, like, really big swaths of Latinos, like Mexican-Americans but the leadership is not. And when you start really looking to places like South Texas, when you have colonias that haven't had running water for decades, and this is the United States of America, um, there's something else here that's playing into the problems and the internalizing of that. Another example is the fact that when you look at South Texas and you look at the border enforcement industry, the majority of border enforcement officials are Latino. 
I mean, I don't want to get into like the history of colonialism and imperialism, but you know, I'm a Puerto Rican as well. Like someone's got to uh, fulfill the uh, the colonial requirements, and and a lot of that just sort of kind of has come kind of come back to fruition, um, given the recent events of you know the passing of Queen Elizabeth II. Um, there are enablers to maintain whiteness and and I don't think we as a community do enough to attack that. And so the internalization is real. Um, I do think the younger generation of Latinos and Latinas, when I talk about the median age being 11, they're having these conversations much more openly than I ever had in the 80s and previously to people in my generation, and especially a lot of Mexican American friends that I know who grew up in Texas, whose parents was like, I, I, Chico, eso no sé. No, we don't talk about that. No se habla, you know, that know your place. And that is changing. Like, I think that's being challenged directly. So um, gives me hope. I have a question, another question that might relate to some hope. We're kind of moved. Um, I have witnessed a remarkable amount of Spanish surname news commentators, local anchors, weather yeah. people, analysts, working cable, local channels, reporting on a whole gamut of news stories. I see yeah. the shift for hiring mestizos as a reaction involving the phonetic qualities exhibited on air, clear, concise, articulate, or is there more to it? That's a great question. Um, all right, so I'm gonna tell you, I'll, I'm gonna approach it from my perspective. Now, if you know Puerto Ricans, um, our Spanish is, you know, the S's and the R's go away, you know, and I'm a journalist and I'm a geek and, um, and I've been in situations where I've auditioned for Spanish language news. And I was told that my accent's like too Puerto Rican, right? But what does that mean, right? Um, where I, you know, like in Puerto Rico, like everyone's a Puerto Rican reporter, right? But in the nations it's like, well, we need to understand you. So I do think there's still this feeling of you have to have sort of the model Latino journalist in front of the camera. Um, what's interesting is they don't get opportunities in English because even though they're bilingual, they're not seen that they can do the job in English. Right. And I, when I showed that slide, remember that slide I showed about like people get, you know, a lot of US Latinos get their content equally in Spanish and English. When I've gone to news stations and news places and I've pitched myself, I'm like, I could, I could report for you in Spanish and I can report for you in English. It, they're like, what are you talking about? Like, what, what is this world that you're talking about? I cannot, I can't even put my head around this. You mean you can do it in both languages? But that's what we have the English person. The English person is better, right? So I've had to deal with that, right? But I also think from the Spanish language perspective, that's also seen, right? So my accent is not good enough to, to report on the news. But you know what's saving this, Barbara and everyone else? And God bless them, at least from the Puerto Rican perspective, Bad Bunny. Like he has made it so damn cool to be Puerto Rican. Like it is cool. Like no one's questioning about bad, but like when he's like, oh, hey, like he's like, oh my God, he sounds like me. He's like a global guy. He's like billion, like this guy is changing the space for us. So he's made it cool to speak in Spanish with a Puerto Rican accent. And I am going to take it. And yes. Someone said Jay Balvin, a uh, lot of chambers, the Colombians. It's like, great. Because that to me, I do think the younger generation of Latinos and Latinas in this country, that median age of 11, who actually are very aware and very bicultural and very bilingual, um, they are seeing through that. They just want authenticity. Like, there's a reason why Spanish language news is i don't say it's dying it's not growing it's because people don't see it as being authentic 
people see it as it's just a representation of colorism in Latin America and of like, you know what I'm saying? Like that to me is, that gives me hope. Like I would love to do more, more work in Spanish just because, but I've just never been, I've just, I've been pushed out of those opportunities. And luckily I'm blessed enough to be able to be bilingual and to be bicultural. So I said, you know what? They're not going to go down route route. I know that, the majority of consumption of media by young Latinos and Latinas is actually in English and bilingual. So I'm going to go down that road because that's really interesting. And that speaks to me who I am. And I'm kind of glad that no, a lot of other people didn't make that decision about 10 years ago <laughs> in a lot of ways. So um, across the board, I think people wonder, and especially with things changing over these political times, where do I see good news, right? Where do I see authentic things I can yeah. believe? And so I wondered if you yeah. could tell us more about news media that, that our viewers could want to get real relevant news about Latino issues. You mentioned before. Well, I'm always going to, yeah, I'm always going to push Futuro Media, futuromedia.org, all our properties. You know, we come from a place, it's journalism with corazón journalism with heart. Um, we're small, we're mighty. We won a Pulitzer. Like I'm not gonna, that victory lap on the Pulitzer, we're still running that victory lap because it was the first Pulitzer ever won by a Latina led and founded organization in the history of the United States. Like that is a historic moment. With that said, we're just one, we're a national outlet, right? I mean, I also write for MSNBC. And I'm still a unicorn in MSNBC. And I say that, and I know this is being recorded and they know it. And I've been critical of the fact that like when they bring people on, you know, they bring this one Latino or Latina to represent all 60 million of us, right? It's just like, they'll bring one black voice. Now let's talk about you're representing every black person in America, right? That's just ridiculous, right? That's just not real. Like we have to push through that. We have to push through those sources, those news outlets to demand more representation. And they're starting to show hope. I mean, the good thing for MSNBC and NBC News is that <clears throat> the former head of Telemundo is in charge of that right now, Cesar Conde. But that takes a while. The best news that I find for this world, for, for, the, for our community, is local digital media. The people that are on the ground talking about culture and arts and music and covering the neighborhoods that they know. They might not have the reach, but they have the soul and the heart. And I would start locally. Um, and if there's nothing locally, and if there's anyone out there inspired to cover their community locally, the technology is there. It doesn't have to be sophisticated. It doesn't have to be a written piece. Um, you know, it's, it could be as simple as a, as a live stream, as talking to people. Um, but I'm also a big fan. What else do I read? Uh, I love NBC Latino and the Latino section of NBC News does an amazing job in our community. Um, in fact, the NBC News story that I linked to in my presentation is actually under the Latino vertical. So NBC Latino, to me, is a really good... Um, has a history. Um, it provides a really strong context um, in terms of political context and political narratives. Um, so you take like a little Futuro Media, you take a little NBC News Latino, um, you know, follow Latino rebels, follow our community, and then you start building, you know, Aldia News, a great one in, out of Philadelphia called Aldia, A L D I A News. Um, they do a really good job. Um, if you're, if you're a, if you, um, one of my favorite outlets out of California is called LA Taco. Um, it started as a food site covering the taco scene in Los Angeles, but now it's become a, a fantastic local news outlet for Latinos in, in Los Angeles. Um, so you have to kind of pick and choose, right? But the sad thing is, there's not a lot of us 
because it speaks to the representation on underinvestment. So what I try to tell people is like, even supporting us, even reading us, even sharing us um, is going to be a big help. But if you know a local blogger, if you know a local podcaster, if you know a local reporter that's covering our community, prop them up, connect with them, reach out to them, elevate their work. That's how things change. You know, it starts at the local level. Um, so, yeah, I wish I had a better answer for that. There's not, there's really nothing out there, unfortunately. Um, and I, and I do think like places like University of Telemundo are, are decent and they, there's really committed journalists, but I also feel like they kind of missed the boat on our community and realizing that we were bilingual, bicultural and getting younger and they've never caught up. And so like a place like Latino Rebels was almost like a response to that lack of understanding by Univision and Telemundo. And I'm, and I'm kind of reaping a little bit of that mistake because at that slide I sent you, like, that's a powerful slide. That's where the world needs to be. And we got a long way to go. So. Well, I want chance if you have any final words you'd like to share with the audience and we'll oh, yeah. getting ready to end today's session. I mean, I think, you know, I, I don't like to do really long like slides and decks because I want you to do this takeaway of the two or three things that you can walk away from. And that media can some, like the two things that really jumped out at me, it's like when I look at the census data, it's like the notion of race and identity and Latinidad is all, that's just a new, th that's going to keep going, right? And that that's going to impact who we are as a country. But also, it's okay to say that, you know, it's not just about things in Spanish. It's bilingual, bicultural, and some of it's English only. And if it's culturally authentic, there'll be plenty of Latinos and Latinas who, who will really, really embrace that. So as the sun starts coming out in Massachusetts, those are my two, my two takeaways. I've I really appreciate the time. Um, and you guys were great. The questions were great. And I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so very, very much. Really appreciate your time with us today, Julio. Um, there's, there's a lot of information there for us to continue considering. Um, think about that census data, watch for it. Get ourselves out into communities that we're unfamiliar with, whether it be virtually or in person. And we, we thank you also for helping us to kick off Metropolitan Community College's Hispanic Latino Heritage Month. And um, from the beginning, your genuine responses uh, have been really, really heartwarming. To thank you, audience, and you were great. You were great, Barbara. I love, I, you, should, you, you could do this for a living. Great moderation. I know you do, <laughs> but I enjoyed this. So audience, thank you for um, joining us for the first virtual audience during the academic year. I hope many of you return and join us next time. Bring a friend who will appreciate learning about a slate of diverse topics and presenters. And MCC students, please remember that even after your graduation, we will be here for your lifelong learning. Joe, could you please put up the evaluation slide everybody in the chat you can see that evaluation address will also email it to you we would appreciate your feedback and tomorrow is our next program same time 12 30 this is the beginning of our 17th annual diversity matters lecture series and our virtual lecture will be by dr nicholas B. Breifogel from the Ohio State University, and he is going to help us understand a little bit about the history behind the war in Ukraine. He was recommended by Bonnie Fitzgerald, for those of you who know her as a history instructor here, and um, we can't wait to see you tomorrow. So thank you, everybody. Have a great afternoon, and thanks again, Julio. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Ciao.